the paint for it to warm up. Amen. Not April. Sister Lori. How did the church keep Stephen prayers so yeah, he's sad?
her name is uh, Eliza. The Philippines. Yeah, I was going to get ready to request prayer. That's fine. Um, yeah, please continue. Remember the folks in, in the Philippines. Um, we have, well, I have about 10, 10 employees that have families in various cities that was hit pretty hard, and um, they have yet to hear from family members. They don't know whether they're alive or dead um, at this point in time, and it's we're going on a week now. Um, so they're, you know, they're pretty devastated over there. There are people that are, are uh, got through the typhoon okay, but they don't know how their family made it, and it's it's very you know devastating to them mentally. So please continue to remember them as they continue the cleanup process and trying to find their family members. For the dreaming. <laughs>
I am uh, very happy to see Mike sit in our congregation tonight. Mike is good seat, I think. He was worried this week. And, uh, and uh, of course, he's, uh, I mean, he's not, not missed any not missed any there to shop or anything, but he's he struggled through a very, very uh, hard time. And uh, we just had to reassure him that uh, there's, only, uh, there's only one place he can go to get the kind of help he needed because there's, there's just not any doctors that, uh, I mean, they can give you guidance, but when it comes to something, stress, mental, and all that, it's, uh, it's all up to God and how you seek Him out. So, and uh, I'm so glad that that's the choice He made. And uh, He's here tonight as a, uh, as a witness to that. So, Mike, we're glad you're still here, bud. Okay? We love you. I'm going to sing, uh, I'm gonna sing uh, uh, th this kind of, kind of testimony to song of mine. It's, uh, because this is kind of, kind of the way I lived. I, I uh, the Lord didn't give up on me, and I just, I just, uh, he, uh, uh, but, but the thing of it is, he, he, you know, when he don't, when he's not going to give up on you, he's not going to give up on you, and this song kind of tells it all for me, because I wouldn't, I was, I was, uh, well, I tell you, be, before my, before my heart off, I, the amount of tears that I had cried for many, many years would probably fill a thumb, thin, little thin. And after my surgery, finding how the Lord, He didn't give up on me. I never sought Him out. Uh, I've, uh, I've cried enough tears since then. I could probably build a 55 gallon drum. And uh, you know what? I just know he's there for me. And this song, he came to me, is uh, kind of my, uh, my testimony. Just go ahead and sing it here.
asked Brother Tad, I said, will you be back? And he didn't give me no answer. <laughs> now I know why he didn't give me an answer. <laughs> well, it's good to be here. And I, uh, someone said you was in revival last week with your uh, local ministers here in the house. And uh, I, I understood him to say that it was going to be the first half of this week and then the last part of the week I was going to do it. Well, it was Tuesday. Okay. Yeah, cool. did go since we broke last night. All right. Well, just get your get your steam back up and help me out, okay? We're working on it. I miss Brother Pat and Sister Daisy, and I, I, you know, I, I like to, I like to have a pastor around when I'm preaching in their church, but he's not here, so we're all we all know each other anyway. So we're gonna do this. <laughs> Praise the Lord, and I, I, I don't know, but I invited some people to come this weekend, and I hope they get to make it from uh, other areas, so we hope they can. And if not, um, we're just happy for everybody that's here tonight. It's good to see you. Praise the Lord. We'll try to sing something. I, uh, the Lord put this on my heart this afternoon. I didn't get a chance to look it up, so I hope I can remember the words.
makes Brother Pat feel really good. That he's got musicians and people in his church that can go ahead when he's not here. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That makes any pastor feel good. Praise the Lord. <coughs> Praise God. Anybody tell me out tomorrow night? John, we're having revival and Jesus is showing up. Amen. Amen. If they need something from God, come on. They just want to have church. Come on. I want to read from 2 Chronicles 7 14. Appreciate everybody that's in the house tonight, folks from West Newton. Uh, good friends. I just appreciate them so much. And uh, all the other folks from. Martinsville, places all around here. Second Chronicles, seven fourteen. <clears throat> you know Sharon Record. You all know Sharon, don't you? Yeah. Remember her uh, daughter and her husband's house caught on fire last night. I'm not sure, and you know how many daughters does she? How many? Is that where it was at? Yeah, and, uh, I guess they lost about everything or something. Yeah, I heard about yeah. Well, pray for them. Pray for them. Yeah, praise God. Well, this, you know, you whenever you get in a conversation with folks, you hear this scripture quoted a lot at this point in time in history because America's in so much trouble. And, uh, you know, and I've shared with you that I got involved a little bit in politics last year. And I'm kind of this year, following through this year. And I talk to people every week on the phone in Monroe County that are voters. <coughs> and uh, mostly conservative, some are not, but mostly. And uh, what I'm finding out is people are getting scared. They're getting concerned. And people from other denominations will even, I don't even bring up prayer because that's not why I'm calling. And so when I'm calling, I don't know who I'm calling, I don't know who I'm going to be speaking with or what, you know, anything about their background, nothing. And a lot of times they just end up talking about prayer. Because what I'm asking them <laughs> is an opinion, their opinion about some of the government stuff that's going on. And they just end up talking about prayer. And it's amazing, a lot of people see that as America's only hope. Amen, yeah. They see that as America's only hope. Yeah. And when I first got involved in politics some last year, I thought, well, all we need is enough people involved and enough people to make a difference. And it does make a difference. And it can make a difference. And it will make a difference if people will get involved because we just don't get involved enough. We have been under the idea that church and state was supposed to be separate and we weren't supposed to do anything but go vote. And a lot of Christians don't even do that. But, you know, we need to do that. That's our privilege. That's our right. And Jesus tells us to be a good steward. So since he birthed us in this nation and this nation belongs to us to be a good steward over this nation, we need to get involved politically and do what we can locally in your town and in your county and wherever you live. I mean, don't be ashamed and don't be afraid, you know, to uh, get involved. But, uh, and I just, I, I, the more I saw, the more I heard, the more I learned, the more I found out about what was going on and the worse things got, I, be, it, I began to realize that we do need to get involved and we do need to do something and we do need to make our voice heard and we do need to make our presence known. Because if you don't, the devil will. Amen. He's got a crowd out there that don't care. I mean, they'll tell you what they think. And it's usually not what you think. <laughs> At all. <laughs> and I said this, you know, uh, if, if Christians aren't elected into office in government, guess who's going to get elected? The devil's people, that's right. Satan's crowd's going to get elected. So... We have to we have to put an effort for it, you know, as much as we can, and make a difference. You can make a difference. You'd be surprised the difference you can make. But final in all of the analysis and everything 
that I examined about what was going on in our nation around the world and what was going on with the government, the voting process and everything, this scripture is what I come to the conclusion of. And we've preached this message before. And you've heard this preach before, I'm sure, many times. But uh, I think it stands alone in this hour as a cry to God's people. Not saying that, you know, we don't know God. Not saying that we're just sinners, out and out sinners or anything like that. But <clears throat> here's what God said to Israel when Israel is getting away from the Lord. And if anybody's getting away from the Lord, America is. When you can kill millions of babies every year in the mother's womb and act like it's nothing. Act like it's nothing. Hello out there. That's right. Amen. And I told some folks, and you know, some of you that have heard me preach lately, you know this. They say there's life on Mars. Have you heard that there's life on Mars? Did you know there's life on Mars? Life that's up there. Because there's bacteria there, there's life on Mars. Well, you have to have a microscope to see under a microscope to see bacteria, don't you? Usually. Unless it's growing, I mean, you know, sometimes it's getting big enough to see the naked eye. But usually you have to have a microscope. That's how tiny it is. That's how microscopic it is. But they believe that. They believe there's bacteria. There's life on Mars. There's bacteria growing on Mars. Now, if bacteria is life, What is a baby in a mama's womb? Amen. That's right. What is an embryo in a mother's womb? Is that life? Sure it is. But here's the thinking that the liberals have. They're willing to accept that a tiny microscopic bacteria is life, but they will not accept that an embryo is life until it's how many weeks into? Come on. Develops little arms, tiny legs. It's 16 or 20 weeks. And uh, I, I just read this just yesterday, and, and uh, they said at, at 16 weeks, with, which you can divorce all the way up to 16 weeks, they said the baby has already developed its fingers, its toes, its arms, its legs. Everything has developed from that child, but they said that child does not feel anything. How can something that's developed, how can it say they okay? So to them, it's not a life yet. No, but it's got all this But it has little toes, little fingers, little arms. So. Little heartbeat. Yeah, yeah. But it's not life. But a bacteria on Mars is life. Now see how twisted that thinking is? Amen. See how ridiculous that thinking is? So we have to learn to think. You, it, God gave us a mind. The Bible said, let this mind be in you that is also in Christ Jesus. Amen. And being uh, spirit-filled people as we are, a lot of times we lean a lot on feeling. But God gave us the ability to think and reason. And He wants us to have wisdom. In fact, the Bible says that wisdom is the principal thing. To have wisdom, you have to think. You have to think things through. But a lot of folks aren't thinking things through in this hour. But when you think about it, so then if it's life and they're taking that life, that's murder, right? Yeah, right. And so what we don't understand is in ancient uh, Middle East where Abraham was born and uh, the Israelis and, and the nation of Israel was born, there were people who worshipped false gods in those days who sacrificed their children to gods. False gods. They took their little babies and sacrificed them in a fire to false gods. That's why God had some of those nations destroyed. That's right. Amen. Because of their sins. And if you look at some of that, you say, well, why did God let them be wiped out? Well, a lot of times we don't realize the evil and the corruption that was in their hearts. And if it's in our hearts, if we're so corrupt in our heart that we can kill an innocent baby and put it in the fire and offer it to a, a, an idol god, 
then abortion seems like it's tracking down the same path. Not only that, but the abortion industry is a financial industry. People are getting wealthy off of the abortion mills. So money's involved. So the love of money, not money, but the love of money is the root of all evil. Right. So there are so many things in our nation today that is just accepted as the normal that 40 years ago wouldn't have been normal. 50 years ago would not have been normal. 60 years ago was never heard of. Just never heard of. Same-sex marriage. The corruption that is in the land today does not go unjudged by the Bible. Amen. And the Bible says, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So we're living in a nation today that has sown seeds of evil. And if we sow evil seeds, that doesn't mean the church is doing that, but the nation we live in is. So if we sow evil seed, then what are we going to reap? Evil. Evil and corruption, right? And God cannot, you, when you think about it, when God brought judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, and He sent angels down in there to lead Lot and his family out, and... When they got out, his wife turned back and looked at Sodom. Her heart was there. It wasn't just the fact that they lived there, but her heart was there. And that's why we can't let our heart be entangled with the world. Because as when our heart gets entangled with the world system, then evil comes into our heart and into our lives. And it has to be judged if we don't repent. <coughs> Thank God there is repentance. When God sent Jonah to Nineveh, God was getting ready to destroy Nineveh because of their sin. And Jonah didn't want to go, and he rebelled about going, so he got on a boat and went to Tarsus. You know the story. And when they got out on the sea, a storm came up. And to get the storm to calm down to keep the boat from sinking, they had to throw Jonah overboard because he confessed, I'm, I'm a Hebrew and this storm is here because of me. I'm running from God. I've disobeyed God. And what God was trying to do was get that prophet in line to go preach to this city so the city would be spared. That's God's love. And sometimes we fail to realize how real God's love is. He's still reaching out to America. Amen. Come on now. God is still reaching out to America. But someone is going to have to pray. Someone is going to have to repent. Someone is going to have to call on the Lord and turn. <laughs> And that's what 2 Chronicles 7.14 says. And it makes it very clear. So I want to read this tonight. If my people, God said, which are called by my name, He didn't say the folks that are outside the kingdom of God, but He said the people that are called by my name. So that sounds like it hinges on you and me. Okay? So we can't depend on the folks down at the tavern tonight to get the job done. We can't depend on folks that are rebelling and sinners on God to get the job done. But we hear the voice of God. We know the voice of God. We sit under the voice and the Spirit and the presence of God. Service after service after service after service. So I believe, and I said this and I will always say this, God's people have no idea how much power they have. You have no idea how much power you have. We very seldom use it. <laughs> and when we do, we're usually begging God to do something. Yeah. Instead of commanding something to happen, we're pleading with God to do something. <laughs> and somebody said, well, I just don't understand what you're talking about. 
Well, the Bible said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What's he talking about? Over every city, over every country, over every uh, county, over every town, over every little burg, over every area, there is a principality that rules that area. And that principality wants to rule the people in that area. And the only way that principality can, can, principality can be defeated is if somebody in the kingdom of God stands up and defeats that principality. Amen. Now, how do you do that? You do that by preaching the Word of God. You do that by singing the songs of Zion. You do that by praise and worship. And you do that by speaking the Word of the Lord. And when you're in prayer, how many times do you say, I just ask yourselves, how many times do I say, I pull down the stronghold that's over Martinsville, Indiana? Okay, well, I will just move along. <laughs> well, here's what happens. When you say that the first time, you feel intimidated. Have you ever said, I rebuke the devil or I rebuke the enemy? Or I bind the principality, I bind? Did Jesus tell Peter, I give you the keys to the kingdom? And whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You've got to get used to saying those words. Because the first few times you'll say them, the devil will say, What are you? You're just nobody. You can't do that. You can't say that. You can't be that. Does he not do that? Yes, amen. So here he comes with doubt and fear and unbelief to fill your brain with all kinds of stuff that's not even in the Word of God. Did you find that in the Bible? Did God ever say he was nobody? Did he ever say you couldn't do anything? We do all things. He said you could do all things. That's right. Through Christ it strengthens us. Did he ever say you were nobody? He said you were kings and priests and heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Is that what he said? Right. Amen. So then we have a place in the kingdom of God and in the earth of authority. Amen. And it takes a while to learn to walk in that. You have to practice it. Just like practicing for ball, or practicing for music, or practicing for anything else, you've got to practice it in prayer. Somebody say, practice in prayer. Practice in prayer. That's good. That sounds good. Practice in prayer. So I know there's times when we're on our face and we're pleading with God, and this scripture actually tells us to repent. But there's times whenever God tells us to take authority over things. Did He mean for us to be nobody and nothing and have no influence in this earth? No, He did not. In fact, He wanted us to change the world. Obama got in office saying He was going to change everything. Boy, He sure is, ain't he? Override the Constitution or didn't want it? He don't care. But we're supposed to make a change. Hello? If you live in a neighborhood, amen, you, you ought to have some influence in your neighborhood. That don't mean you have to go around and tell everybody, hey, I'm this and I'm that and I'm something else. That means your life is an influence to those around you. <clears throat> so I say, my life is an influence. Man, you're sounding good. I believe you believe that. Amen. You're an influence to those around you. Family members, neighbors, people on the job. Amen. And when God quickens your spirit to be a light and a witness, you can be a light and a witness. But that's not all your influence. Your influence where you are is prayer and your prayer life. How much you pray. What kind of prayers you pray. Do you pray in confidence or do you pray in unbelief? Do you pray knowing God answers your prayers? Or do you pray wondering if He will answer your prayers? Well, come on now. He told me He will and I believe. Yes, ma'am. He told me He will and I believe Him. See, that's the attitude you have to have. That's the mindset you have to have. You have to change your way of thinking instead of getting down to pray and thinking, man, I hope God answers my prayers today. I just don't know what I'm going to do if He don't. But you've got to think like the Word thinks. You've got to think like God thinks. 
What did he say? Ask and you shall what? Receive. Knock and you shall, it shall what? Open. Be open unto you. Seek and you shall what? Find. Find, absolutely. So when you fill your heart and your mind with those words, when you go to God in prayer, you go to God with confidence that He is and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Amen. If we didn't know that, why would we even take time to pray? But we know that tonight. And so what He said in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people, God's saying, my people, the people in the kingdom, which are called by my name, those who go by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. Somebody said, well, I'm not out in the world. I ain't got no wicked ways. Well, just hold on a second. Not judging one another or anybody, do you ever go before God and say, God, am I pleasing you in everything? Do I obey you every time you speak to me? <laughs> Lord, do I have any wicked ways? Do you ever go to God and say, search me, God? Yes, amen. David did, didn't he? Yes, he, did. he was a man after God's own heart, but he went before the Lord and said, search me, oh God, see if there be any wicked way in me. He's the one that killed the giant. He's the one that went out, amen, and could kill a lion and kill a bear. He's the one that could go out and take care of sheep and protect them from all the wild animals around in the country. He was the one who led, amen, the children of Israel, the armies of Israel against the Philistines. He was the one who had the courage to fight the battles and win the battles. But he said, God, search me. Search my heart. See if there's anything wicked in me. Well, let me ask you this question. Do you have any hatred against anybody? Is there anybody we have not forgiven? Is there anybody we would like to get revenge on? <laughs> See what I'm saying? So you don't have to be down at the you don't have to be down at the juke joint, amen, or down at the bar or whatever. To have wicked ways. You don't have to rob a bank to have wicked ways. And a lot of times the stuff we hide in our heart, nobody knows about but me and you. Come on. Jealousy. Envy. Strife. Come on, I'm trying to help us tonight. And David said, search me, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me. And so what God said to the children of Israel, turn from your wicked ways. So it's good to, to let God search our hearts and cleanse us from all iniquity. Wash us in the blood, Jesus. Let your blood cleanse me, Lord. Help me forgive my enemies, Jesus. Help me pray for those that persecute me and despite me. Use me, Lord. Somebody talks about us, what we want to do is a lot of times turn around and talk about them. We don't want to forgive them. Boy, it's getting quiet in this house. <laughs> but here's what he said. He said, if we want our land healed, we got to do this. <laughs> he said, search me, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me. That's what David said. And God said, humble ourselves. I told some folks the other night, it's better to humble ourselves than have God humble us. Yes, it is. You want to humble yourself instead of having Him humble you. I, I don't ask God to humble me. I've been there and done that, bought the t-shirt, and it's no fun. I would rather humble myself first. <laughs> Amen. I say, God, you know, I, I'm not as holy and righteous, you know, as I'm just not. I'm, I'm not all that. I am not all that. I need your help, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And he said, humble ourselves and humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then God said, then. See, God never gives us a problem without giving us a solution. And in the previous verse, 
God said to the children of Israel, if I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, if I command the locusts to devour the land, if I send pestilence amongst my people, God saying, if all this stuff comes on the land, then I, I, I want you to do this thing. I want you to humble yourself and pray and turn from your wicked ways. And God said, then... I will hear from heaven. Then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin, God said. There was one prophet of old when he was praying and repenting, and it was Daniel, actually, when Daniel was carried away captive into Babylon, into the Babylonian Empire, after Israel had sinned till God sent judgment on Israel. When they carried Daniel away to the Babylonian Empire where there were all kinds of false gods, they kept him alive. Him and many of the other wonderful uh, musicians, they took him out of the temple, and they took him to Babylon, and the scholars and the wise men. And, and it, when he was in, in, in Babylon, he was praying for Israel. He was praying for his people. He was praying for them to go back to their homeland and asking God, when can we go back home, God? And when Daniel was praying, he was putting himself with the rest of them that had sinned. In other words, he was saying to God, we have sinned, not they have sinned. But we have sinned. Come on. And so what we have to realize when we call on the name of the Lord, we have to put ourselves in that place of repentance. Not try to say, God, they need to repent, and they need to repent, and they need to repent, and somebody else needs to repent. No, we need to put ourselves in that place and say, God, search my heart. Help me repent. And repent means turn from. Help me repent of the things that I am doing that displeases you. And here's what he said God would do. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. And I will heal their land. Amen. How many know tonight America needs healing? Amen. We all know that. We see it on the news every day. We all know that America is in a bad shape. This is a bad time. Amen. I, I, we worked and worked and worked trying to get Obamacare stopped because we knew some of the consequences of what was going to happen. And when I'd talk to people on the phone, uh, they'd say, well, I had my hours cut. And this was weeks and weeks. And this was back in the summer. They were already, people were already feeling the pain. I've had my hours cut. My insurance has gone up. My uh, company is laying people off. Come on now. And I've talked to nurses. I've talked to doctors. I've talked to people all across the spectrum. I've talked to school administrators and everybody. And I'm laying people off. And I don't want to, but I have to. And I'm letting people go. And they knew what was coming with this insurance law. They knew what was coming. And they were trying to get ready to save their companies. And to save their school uh, schools from being overstaffed and spending too much money. People were trying to get ready for what was coming. And we've just seen the tip of the iceberg. Yes. That's right. Amen. Over 5 million people have already lost their health insurance. And I, I'm not against people having health insurance that can't afford it. But I am against anything that would cause people to lose their jobs. Shut their doors. I've talked to a small business owner that shut their doors. They've been in business for 20 years. And a lot of times because we live in our own little community and we don't, we don't talk to people on a broad spectrum, we don't realize what's coming. We don't realize the, the ugly train that's coming down the track. We don't realize what's happening all around us and the things that are going on, on all around us. But I'm going to tell you today, amen, that if America don't turn around now, I said now, America's got to turn around now. Amen. And that's why I've got to say this tonight to you. And you can ask these folks from West Newton. A priest a message something like this in Indianapolis about two or three weeks ago. And people stood around the front for over 30 minutes praying in the Holy Ghost at the end of the service. Praying for our nation and for our churches and for our people. Because if we don't, if we don't get a hold of God now and turn this nation around. So I said, well, what can I do? I can't do anything. I'm just telling you what you can do. I'm telling you what we can do. I'm telling you that we have the power to do this. I'm telling you that we have the authority in Jesus to do this. And whatsoever we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever we loose in earth shall be loosed in heaven. Come on. Hallelujah. And so now, when we're facing these things, amen, if, if we put our spirit 
in tune with God and say, God, search me. If we, if we get a hold of God now, I'll tell you what I believe. I believe we can see one of the greatest revivals that America's ever seen. Amen. Come on, amen. I believe we can see people so stirred up, they're already stirred up. Amen. The Baptist. I'm talking Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian. Come on, amen. I talked to them. I, I told somebody the other day, they said they was talking about uh, getting their church, changing the name on the church to uh, a different name. And I said, well, there ain't anything wrong with that. And, they, and, and we was talking about being licensed and thing. I said, I'm almost at the place where I don't even want to be a certain denomination. Because certain denominations, if you line yourself up and say, well, I'm this or I'm that. Hi. Claiming Jesus is enough. Being a Christian is enough. But there's a lot of things that's went on in a lot of denominations that's turned people off to the gospel. That's right. Come on. Right. See, anybody know that tonight? Right. It's the truth. And so a lot of people have been chased out of church and run out of church, amen, in a lot of denominations uh, because they didn't fit the, the, the category that people wanted to put them into. And what we need to do is realize God has got people in this country. In this nation, there are people who know how to pray. They may not go to your church. They may not go to the church, amen, that we're used to going to or the denomination that we're used to being around. But they are stirred up. Come on, amen. I feel like talking about this tonight. And once you get God's people stirred up, I don't care what we call ourselves, as long as we know Jesus and, and are Christians, and when you get God's people stirred up, and you get God's people on their knees praying and seeking God, I'll guarantee you tonight you'll see a revival. Amen. You'll see sinners come through the door. You'll see people come to the altar. You'll see people give their heart to Jesus. You'll see people get right with God. Isn't that what we're here for? Amen. Come on, that's what we're all about, children. Amen. Amen. And not just that, amen, but to turn this country around. Amen. And get Christian values, amen, back in our government. Come on. Hallelujah to God. The word government, do you know what government really is? It determines who rules over who. Amen. Think about that. Government determines who rules over who. Now, if you want an antichrist spirit ruling over you, personally, I don't. <laughs> They're now talk, talking about taxing every mile you drive. Not just your gas, but every mile you drive. How many miles do you drive a week? How many miles do you drive to church? How many miles do you drive to the store? How many miles do you drive to work? That's what they're talking about in taxing your mileage, not just your gas. Well, I have for years, and you know I'm an evangelist, so I travel all the time. But when I, when I wasn't traveling so much, I drove 55 miles to get to a church. And another 55 to get home. I don't know how far you all drive. Maybe some of you live right here in town. Maybe some of you live out in the country. Maybe some of you walk to church. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you something. If my people, there's an answer. Amen. Right. Come on, children, there's an answer. Yes. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and you may think your prayers don't go very far, but let me tell you, they do. Amen. Whenever you call on the name of the Lord, in the name of Jesus, He hears your prayers. Yeah. Amen. Don't ever let the devil tell you God doesn't hear your prayers. And if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. So I said, I don't have time to pray. You don't have time not to pray. Amen. Right. You don't have time not to pray. <laughs> Come on, amen. Turn off the TV for a while. Amen? Just anything you have to do to cut out some little bit of good stuff here and there and yonder. Amen? To take the time to pray and seek the face of God. And get on your knees and say, Jesus, search my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. Joel said this. When Israel was being invaded by all kinds of uh, insects and everything else that was eating their crops and they were running out of crops, they were running out of food, they were running out of food for their animals, 
They were running out of everything. And God said if the ministers would weep between the porch and the altar. Amen. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. And let the ministry, let the ministers weep between the porch and the altar. We got, we got a, we got a, uh, I don't know whether I'm going to say this or not. But we have, we have this little <laughs> bunch of preachers anymore that, you know, they're really not interested too much in souls. It don't matter too much, you know, about, uh, about whether the, uh, the church stays alive or not just so they get to preach. <laughs> Shame on them. That's right, shame on them. That's right, Georgiana. Amen. Because when God gives you a burden to do something and He puts it in your spirit, it's not about you anymore. It's not about you anymore. And I'm here tonight to call us back to God. I am here tonight to call us back to the altar. I am here tonight to call us back to prayer. And I'm not saying there's a one in this house that's not saved. But I've got a message and that's my message. I'm here to call us back to God so we can get a hold of God for this nation. Amen. Come on, hallelujah. You can change things. You can turn things around. You can make a difference. Come on, I'm talking to you all tonight because I know I've got confidence. I've probably got more confidence in you than you've got in yourself. I probably do. Because I know, I know it's in you. I know it is. Hallelujah. But I can remember how timid I used to be. I can remember how, you know, whenever you pray and you don't want to pray too loud because you're afraid somebody will hear you and you don't want to pray too much because you're afraid the devil will get mad. I've heard people say this, well, I got a blessing tonight. I'll probably face the devil tomorrow. Do you ever hear? They're afraid to go to church and get blessed. They're afraid they'll face the devil tomorrow. My God, have mercy. What is that? God did not give us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. So we're going to pray tonight. Somebody get us some music. We're going to pray. I want you to come back tomorrow night with your shouting shoes on and bring somebody with you. But we're going to pray. Because there are some people here tonight that know how to get a hold of God. Amen. Hallelujah. There are some folks here tonight you know how to put your faith to work and say, God, you move in Washington, D.C. however you have to move. Come on. God, you move in Martinsville however you have to move. God, you move in Indiana however you, however you have to move. All these Congress people and all these presidents and all these commi committee men and all, all these people. I don't, I, you know, I know a lot of people don't watch the news a whole lot. It probably, probably keeps you from being depressed too much, but I want to say this. When we can let four of our men Set in Benghazi yeah. and be attacked by terrorists. Right. And we have the best military on this planet. And we don't send them any help. If that don't stir you up, I don't know what to tell you. I talked to a nurse on the phone the other night and she had said we called a health care company that was on the Obamacare exchange to ask them about helping a lady who had a terminally, terminally ill disease and because of her age they would not pay for her to have medical assistance. That means you can get too old and be too big a risk for you to deserve a doctor. Yes, sir.
helps you to keep track of your children. Okay. Plan, plan, plan. Plan, plan. Okay. And I'm not here to scare anybody. I'm not here to put fear in anybody. I'm here to say, you have the capability to make a change. Don't ever let the devil tell you you can't make a difference. God spoke to me over a year and a half ago, probably too close to two minutes, about two and a half years ago. And he told me this. He said, I have a plan for America. And I knew it was the voice of God when he spoke to me. So all of this theology that has went around about America being blown up, you know, America's not going to last and all this kind of stuff. I believe what God says when he says what he does. I believe God has a plan for America. But I also believe His people have to take their stand. I believe we have to take our stand. We have to take our position on the wall. we got to be like a watchman on the wall. And we got to stand with God. And stand with God's principles. People are afraid to be counted. They're afraid to stand up. They're afraid... You know, somebody will make fun of them or somebody will point their finger at them or somebody will say something bad about them. God didn't give us a spirit of fear. He gave us power and love and a sound mind. Amen. It don't make no difference. I mean, I've been told everything in the world on the phone. I've been cussed out and everything else. I just hang up, take a deep breath, and pray a little bit and keep on going. Come on, amen. Shall humble themselves. 
Heal his mind tonight, Jesus. Heal his body, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I tell you what I feel like doing with the rest of you that are here tonight. I know some have already gone home. If you would like to be an intercessory prayer for your I want you to just line up across the front. If you would like for God to give you a spirit to intercede and pray and seek His face, just stand across the front. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I appreciate you, brother. I appreciate you. I bless you. He loves you. He loves you, man. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Just stand across the front. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Come out here and anoint you, brother. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. One of the greatest gifts is the gift to pray. The gift to intercede. It is one of the greatest gifts God has ever given to mankind. Hallelujah. And we're asking tonight, everyone standing here this evening, receive the gift of intercession. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah. Pray, brothers. Put your hands up and pray, brother. God bless you for coming. Yes, Lord, hallelujah. God bless you for coming forward. God bless you for coming forward. God, anoint him to pray in the Holy Ghost. Anoint them to pray in the Holy Ghost. Anoint them to pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in tongues. Pray in tongues. Pray in tongues. Pray in tongues. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in tongues. Hallelujah. Pray in tongues. Hallelujah. That's the 
intercession, Lord. Intercession, God. God, you call them out. You call them out to intercede, Jesus. Hallelujah. That's it, saints. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Let the Holy Ghost pray. Let the Holy Ghost pray. Let Him pray. He knows what to pray for. He knows what to ask for. He knows what to ask God to do. The Holy Ghost knows.